welcome everyone to our fourth annual Turfy Lecture in Mathematics and Statistics. These lectures are made possible by a generous donation from Al Turfey. Uh, Al is sitting right over here. We won't ask him to stand up, but we should give him a hand. <laughs> oh, he's going to stand up anyway. Uh, so before we get started, let me introduce our chancellor, Daniel Little, who will have a few words to say. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It's really special for me to be able to say thank you to Al and to uh, welcome you all to this Al Turfey Special Visiting Lecture Series in Mathematics. As a former math student myself, I'm really looking forward to today, and also, by the way, cellist. So I think there's a real nice crossover for me in terms of my own interests. But this is just a really dramatic demonstration of the impact which donors can have to the educational and academic and engagement successes of our students. So I want to express my thanks and the thanks of the university in support of this, um, this wonderful series. But also the, um, the new addition, which is the video monitors in several places in this building and uh, the addition which that brings to the castle building. This is a digital world that we're in, and this allows us to be even more digital. So thank you. And uh, thank you for this very interesting lecture, which we will, are about to hear. So thanks. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor David Kung from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Professor Kung obtained his undergraduate degree, master's, and doctoral degrees in mathematics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, all three. His thesis, Local Smoothing Phenomena for Operators Failing the Cinematic Curvature Condition, was completed under the direction of Andreas Seeger. Following his PhD, he accepted a position at St. Mary's, and since then, he was chosen to give the 2010 Mathematical Association of America, which I will abbreviate in the subsequent stuff to MAA, undergraduate lecture in mathematics at the joint math meetings. And he is the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2006 Teaching Award uh, from the Maryland, Virginia, DC section of the MAA. So in addition to teaching and researching mathemat mathematics, Professor Kung has shown great commitment to the promotion of mathematics, especially to underserved portions of the US. He has co-instituted an emerging scholars program at St. Mary's, and through his work with the MAA's Project Next, a program he is now the director of, he has helped focus attention on mathematics and social justice. He was invited to present the closing address on diversity in STEM fields at the 18th annual Inquiry-Based Learning Conference in Austin, Texas in 2015. Professor Kung has produced two Great Courses DVD series from the teaching company uh, on how music and mathematics relate which is our topic for today, and Mind-Bending Math, Riddles and Paradoxes, which was the topic of an earlier lecture today. And both of these DVDs will be available for purchase after the talk, and Professor Kung will sign them for you if you so desire. As we will shortly see, he's an accomplished violinist who began playing at age four, but he is also an avid cyclist, runner, and swimmer who admits to combining sports by competing in triathlons. So you can ask him afterwards how he budgets all the time for these many activities. Uh, so without further ado, our Turfy Lecture for 2016, Professor David Cohn. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for having me here at Dearborn. It's been a wonderful day. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I did think that uh, since it's a lecture on math and music and these things don't normally go together, that it deserved at least some uh, introduction as to why we're talking about mathematics and music. So I had very mathematical parents. Both of my parents were math teachers. Um, in terms of music, my, my dad is completely tone deaf. Um, my mom, on the other hand, was, was a musician and played clarinet and piano. And so she got me started really early on, on the violin. That's me at age five. I know, you're looking at the pants, aren't you? <laughs> what can I say? It, it was the 1970s. Um, and, uh, and so I started playing violin when I, when I was age four. Um, I didn't think of these parts of my life, mathematics and music, as combined at all until I got to St. Mary's. Uh, I, I interviewed for a job. When you finish a PhD in mathematics, you go to the joint math meetings. And those of you who've been there know exactly what it looks like. You beg for a job. You get a little more dressed up than you're used to as a graduate student. And you beg for a job. And, uh, and so I, I met this guy, Richard Stark. And uh, he's a short Austrian man. 
and we shook hands, and we sat down at this interview table, and the very first question out, out, of, his, uh, out of his mouth, he said, so, you play the violin. Like, I'm interviewing for a job as a mathematician. I was not expecting this. Um, and I said, yeah, clearly you've read my CV very carefully, because that's at the very end. And he said, well, can you play the bakshakon? <laughs> this is my first question from this. So uh, if you don't know, so Bach wrote six unaccompanied pieces for viol solo violin with nothing else on, on stage. And, uh, and, and the bakshakon is sort of is like the pinnacle of this. So the bakshakon, for those of you who don't read music, the point here is that it's hard. OK. Um, the, the Bach Chocon, it's really difficult music. And uh, it, it was an interview. I tried to do my best. I said, I said, you know, I cannot play the Bach Chacon. I can play a lot of other unaccompanied Bach, but I cannot play the Chacon. And he looked across the table, and he looked at me, and he said, well, we cannot give you this job. <laughs> that, was, that was my introduction. But uh, somehow I got the job. Maybe nobody else could play the Chacon that year. So I got the job at St. Mary's. And now I see these as very much combined mathematics and music. I teach a first year seminar on mathematics and music. And at the end of the seminar, my students put on a mathematics concert where they perform things that have mathematical content. Here's my, my student, Matt, uh, showing, demonstrating some mathematical principles by hitting a hammer on, on piano strings. Um, and uh, as Alan mentioned, I have a great courses lecture series out there as well. Now this talk is for both sides of your brain, so I hope both sides of your brain are warmed up. For your left brain, I really want to talk about some things like this. The mathematics is predicting musical phenomena, and I want to talk about why mathematics is both powerful and difficult. And then for the right side of your brain, I want to talk about instrument sounds and the things that you hear if you're going to an orchestra or if you hear any sort of acoustical group. Um, and I also want to talk at the end about mathematical structures that are hidden inside, ma inside music using different compositional techniques. The point here is that both of these subjects can help us understand each other. So we're going to get, both, we're going to get crossover in both directions here today. It's a talk in three movements, right? So we'll have three different parts, of parts talking about the mathematics. And after each one, I will play a piece on my violin. And so it's sort of like a concert talk all mixed into one. Um, and so throughout, there's going to be music. So um, what I want to start with is, is just sort of a vibrating object. You know, this could be a string or a, a column of air. But, and you might think that if I play a string, what we get is just sine waves, right? Now, I can do this. My computer happens to be over here. So I'm going to go over here and record. Uh, record just an A. And then we can see if it's just sine waves. So here's an A recorded. So there we go. Now, if it's just an A, when we zoom in, we should just see a normal, normal sine wave, if it's just a sine wave. Does that look like a sine wave to you? That's definitely not a sine wave. And one of the things we can do with this technology um, is we can look at it more closely, and we can analyze it. Um, and we can do what's called plotting the spectrum. Now, if we plot the spectrum, we're really taking a Fourier transform. If it were just a sine wave, what we would, see, where we would about, be about to see is a single peak right at 440 hertz, because this string is going back 440 times per second. So let's plot the spectrum and see what we get. That is most definitely not just one peak. That is a whole sequence of peaks. And if I were to zoom in a little bit, you would see that this very first peak is indeed at 440 hertz, but the rest of these are at different places. And so these are called the overtone series. And so that's, we have a lot to learn from this. And so we know that it's not just a sine wave. And that's really clear from this, from what we've done. Um, and so we can figure out exactly what else is, is going on. How are these overtones related, and what does it tell us? Now, you know if you've had a calculus class in the last, say, 15 years or taught one, the mathematicians are really keen on looking at different things from different perspectives, right? From an algebraic perspective or a graphical perspective. And this is no different. And so I want to look at these overtones from a sound, from a visual, and finally from a mathematical perspective. So from a sound perspective, I could demonstrate these on a violin, but it's actually, you know, Chancellor, if, if I had known you were a cellist in the room, I would have, I would have had you do this live. But um, I have a friend of mine who, who did this on, on cello, and I, and I had her play through the overtones. So when you're hearing a single string, you're actually hearing all of the following notes.
That's her playing through each one of those peaks in turn. And when she plucks a single string, that single A string, you're hearing a little bit of each one of those. Mathematically speaking, you're hearing a linear combination of all of those different sounds. So that's sort of a, a, a sound perspective, but we can also actually see a visual perspective. And uh, uh, I, I need some help with this. Mahal, is that your name, right? So please give him a round of applause. He's going to give me a little help. So again, maybe if you stand over here, and we're going to try not to hit anybody in the front row. Um, Right, so you know, you might think that uh, you know, if it were if it were just a sine wave, then what would happen if we zoomed in on my string is that it would be it would be vibrating like this. And I already told you that it's not just a sine wave. And it, so it turns out that my string is not only doing this, my string is also simultaneously doing this. Right, and what I want you to notice is that um, is that there's this place in the middle where the string isn't moving. In fact, you know. One of you in the front row, you could almost reach out and just sort of touch right in the middle, and we could just keep, ro keep spinning the string and there would be no problem. Right? We call that a node, and I want you to notice that it's halfway up the string and that each one of these loops is exactly half the length of the string. Um, and I think that the that, that cellist played more than two, right? Definitely more than two. Right? And so the string is also doing something a little bit more complicated. So the string is also going like this. And now what you see is you see two nodes. Each one of these loops is now one third of the string, right? And again, if you reached out and touched one third of the way up the string, we could still keep rotating this. There would be no problem. Let's see. Can we get four? I think. All right. Let's see. Let's see if we can get four. So there's four, and you can see there's three nodes, and you can also see um, three nodes: one th one fourth, half, and three fourths. And you can see that each one of those is one fourth of the length of the string. I know this may not be my day. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we can get five. Oh, I had it there for a second. Did you see that? I'll give it one more shot at this. There we go. There's five. All right. Thank you very much. Nice work. Thanks, Mahal. We can also look at this situation mathematically. And I guess I should warn you before we go to this slide. Are, are there any people who are coming at this from the music side who are sort of a little math phobic? So if you're in that group, you might want to look away from the screen. You can even do that thing you do when you look at, at like solar eclipses, like you poke a hole in a piece of paper and you sort of look at what comes through. Just be careful, right? But I, this won't last long, though. I, I, trust me on this. Um, so if you wanted to understand this mathematically, we would do things like this. We would say, oh, the string is deforming in some function, some sort of f of x. And we would say u of x in, at, at position x and time t, the string might be higher or lower than its normal position. Right? And we could look at this, and you can imagine being just a little piece of that string. And if the string were pulling in equal and opposite directions, then there would be no net force on you. But if the string were pulling in, in slightly different directions, then there would be a net force, either up or down. And so it's not the slope of the string that's important. It's the change in the slope of the string. The slope would be the first derivative. The change in the slope is the second derivative. And that's why we have the second partial there in x times the length of the string. Now the mass times the acceleration, we typically, physicists typically use rho for the mass per unit length times the length. Um, and then we multiplied the acceleration is the second derivative in t. The velocity would be the first derivative in t. We use Newton's third law, Newton's law force equals mass times acceleration. We set these equal to each other and we get what mathematicians call the wave equation. Now the wave equation by itself um, needs some additional information. In, in this particular case, it needs boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are that the string never moves here. People know this end of the string. What's this thing called? The bridge. The bridge. Uh, what's this end of the string called? Anybody know? The violin? It's called the nut. So the string never moves at the bridge or the nut. And that's what these two uh, boundary conditions tell us. And then the bottom boundary condition says that if we distort the string into some function f of x, and then just let go. That's what those bottom two boundary conditions are doing. But I do want to point out, we're going to need this later. The boundary conditions on the end are that the string never moves. And that's going to be important. Now, the goal of doing this mathematics is to predict the future. And in this case, it's to understand these overtones. You know, I think we've lost a little bit of this, this importance in mathematics. You know, when I was a student, I felt like most of the math classes I took had a goal that was something more like to get through chapter four. <laughs> Did you take that class too? 
Yeah, like, you know, it's true that the, the goal of much of mathematics is to predict the future. It's to understand the world, to actually predict what's going on. Boy, is that more compelling than getting through chapter four. Like, we should maybe get back to that in terms of teaching mathematics. So the goal of this is to predict the future. We should be able to understand what's going to happen with these vibrations just by doing this little bit of mathematics. And if we do this, you can figure out one of the solutions is the sine of ax times the cosine of at. You could check. It's a nice calculus exercise. If you take two derivatives in x or two derivatives in t, you get the same thing. But it, not all values of a work to satisfy this boundary condition. Only certain values of a work. Those are the values of a that will work, and those are the overtones. So we can mathematically predict that you're going to get just certain spikes when we play this a string. And those, those uh, particular spikes are given right there. If we go on and solve this equation, we get this very complicated thing. Um, uh, in particular, we get uh, lovely, lovely, uh, lovely equations in here. And if we want to match the initial condition, we have to use something called Fourier sine series to get the coefficients of f. But when we do that, we get the actual solution and we can predict the future. That's pretty impressive. Yay, mathematics. Oh, that deserves a little bit. That's, that's, that's an exciting thing. Let, let me, may, maybe it's late in the afternoon. Let me try this again. You see, what we do is we do all of this mathematics, and it gives us these equations, and we can predict what's going to happen. Yay, math. Oh. All right, much better. <clears throat> In this case, what does it tell us? This tells us that we're not getting just one uh, vibration. We're going to have to, a series of vibrations. We get these overtones. And in particular, it tells us that these overtones have very uh, predictable frequencies. The frequencies are given by this equation. And you can see some things about that equation. If you make L shorter, if you make the length of the string shorter, L is in the denominator, and so the frequency is going to go up. And that's exactly what we do when we play the violin. You put your finger down, you're shortening the string, and you get a higher frequency. The fundamental frequency, the overtones are going to be just the multiples of that. right? And if you look, instead of at frequency, if you look at wavelengths, in fact, you could see that on the jump rope when Mahala and I were doing that. First it was the entire string, and then it was half, and then one third, and then on like that. Um, and so in, in terms of wavelengths, we get these reciprocals. I think it is a tragedy of mathematics education that so many students get through Calc 2 having seen the harmonic series but having no idea where, why we call it the harmonic series. This is why we call it the harmonic series, because it comes from the harmonics on a string. It's exactly the one, one half, one third, one fourth, on and on up. Here's a table of these. I wanted to play through. I can only get through, and you know, I can't get through 15 or whatever that, the, that my friend Yvonne did, but I wanted to play these for you. So um, here's the fundamental A. And then the next overtone. And so this would be equivalent to when we had this jump rope out here and we had it going in two pieces. And then the next one is an E. It's no longer an A. And then A. And I put the two up there to indicate that we're now two octaves above the original. And I want to stop here for a second to, to tell you, to remind you, what this is saying is that if I just pluck the string, you're hearing a little bit of this and a little of this and down and down this chart. So here we go again, A, C sharp, E, the question mark. It's a question mark because that's not a, a note that's on the Western piano. You will not find that note on a keyboard. It's in between two of the keys. And you can go on and on up from there. And so you're hearing all of these different pitches when we vibrate just a single string. And that's, um, that's sort of amazing. That's why we call it a, symph a symphony in a single note. If you were to study a vibrating tube of air instead of a, a vibrating string, this is sort of a stunning fact. It's exactly the same mathematics. In that case, you're not talking about how far a string is moving. You're actually talking about the pressure building up inside of that tube of air. It tells you you should get the same overtones. It's making a prediction about what a flute should do. And if we take a flute and we try to blow through it and blow up and higher and higher frequencies, Here's what we get. I want you to notice that my friend Aaron isn't going to change his fingers on it. This is in his entire flute um, vibrating. It's exactly the same sequence of notes because the mathematics is the same. And in fact, 
all tubes are like mathematically and musically similar. So I went and bought a tube. <laughs> I just went to my pool supply store. Um, and if what I'm saying is true, this tube should be as good as any other tube. Now, most musical instruments that are tubes of air allow you to lengthen and shorten them, right? So in the flute, you open and close uh, different valves and you get longer and shorter. But there is one instrument in the brass family that doesn't allow you to do that. You know what it is? The bugle. I heard it somewhere. The bugle. The bugle is just a length of, t of tube, right? And the only thing you can do is blow harder and softer. You can vibrate it at slightly different frequencies. So anything you can play on a bugle, you should be able to play on this. <laughs> what do we normally hear on a bugle play? Yeah. Yeah. Reveille. <laughs> there's, there's a smart one in every crowd. <laughs> you want me to play reveille? No, let's go for taps. All right. <laughs> if you don't know why that was funny, you should YouTube reveille later. OK. Um, so here, here's taps on a tube of air. Thanks very much. Um, here's an uh, even more amazing fact. It's the same exact math max that when you apply it in a physics class tells you that electrons can have only certain energy levels. And in fact, it's exactly the same mathematics if you're talking about an infinite square well is what the physicians, the physicists, the physics folks talk about, right? Poincaré said this, mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things, right? This is a fantastic, uh, a, a fantastic idea, right? And I think we forget how amazing this is. And uh, you know, it takes us seeing a little kid, like uh, learning this for the first time. Uh, our daughter is almost five years old, right? And she has figured out that, for instance, like if you have two apples and then you add three apples to that, she can count them and tell you that there are five apples. And at some point, she is going to realize it works for bananas too. <laughs> and cupcakes, and carburetors, and maple trees, and anything you want, right? Mathematics, addition is just addition. You don't have to be, you don't have to care what it is you're adding, it's just addition, right? The mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. And we forget how to, what an amazing fact this is. And in this case, it's the mathematics of a vibrating string, which is the same of a tube of air, which is the same as an electron. And that's just an amazing thing. Mathematics is abstract, and that's what makes it so powerful. On the other hand, that's also what makes it really difficult to teach. Because we could teach you calculus, or maybe we should teach calculus and how it's applied in biology, or economics, or physics, or chemistry, or any of those things. But somehow, we need to just get across the calculus, the theoretical math, and then you can go off and figure out exactly how to apply it in all these great fields. Now, I have a different tube of air that I also just picked up uh, this time at a, at a hardware store, right? Um, and this tube of air, it does has the same properties, and you should <coughs> you can play this tube of air exactly the same way, uh, or in a similar way. But with this tube of air, I want to tweak this problem a little bit. And in particular, what I want to do is tweak um, the boundary conditions. Now, the boundary conditions when you're talking about a tube of air are that it the, is that the pressure can build up inside the tube, but not at the end points, right? The pressure just has to go to the ambient pressure, which we'll just call zero at the ends. Um, and so if I just have this tube of air, notice that I'm not covering the entire thing. I'm just hitting across it, right? And so that's what this problem looks like. And now I want to ask the question, you know, if I close this on one end and then tap it again, do you think the pitch is going to go up to a higher note? Do you think it's going to stay the same or do you think it's going to go down to a lower note? I, I, want, you, I want you to vote. How, uh, how many people are with this guy? You think it's going to go up to a higher note? Uh-huh. How many people you think it's going to go down? to a lower note, and how many people think it's going to stay the same? All right, so, um, so we could do this like this. But you know, I just told you that like, the mathematics was like, it's, it's how you predict the future, right? So we should be able to just predict it mathematically and not just, have, not just test it. So let's do this. Let's see if we can predict it, and then we'll come back and test it. So 
What happens is if you do the mathematics, it changes the boundary condition. And on one end, you still have it 0. But on the other end, what turns out is it has to be a max or a min. So you have to have a maximum or a minimum on the other end. And that means that the fundamental is going to look like this. And that allows us to answer our question. Right? If you compare the wavelength on an open versus a closed tube, on an open tube, you should get a fundamental that looks like that. On a closed tube, it will look like that. And we can just extend that and see what the full wave looks like. It's about twice as long. right? Longer wavelengths means lower. And so the closed end, it says it should double the wavelength. It says it should go down almost an octave. That's what the mathematics is predicting. Boom, 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 boom. Can you help me out here? Okay, so here's, here's the one note. And when we close it off, there we go. Again, one note, and we go down almost exactly an octave. Wow, you know, um, if we test that, math is doing fairly well today. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> now, this is a question all students should ask all the time. Why do we care? All right, so open-ended, closed-ended tubes. Why do we care? In this case, I think we care. Uh, here's one reason we care. It's because we actually, this gives us information about, about instruments. A flute is an open-ended tube. You're not completely closing the mouthpiece, the head tube on, on, on your mouth. Air is escaping. On the other hand, a clarinet is closed. There's no air coming out the side of a clarinet, so pressure can build up on the mouthpiece of a clarinet. That tells us something. The clarinet, these are about the same size. The clarinet plays much lower, almost an octave lower. Why? Because it's a closed-ended tube. Because the mathematics says, even though it's about the same size, it should play about an octave lower because it's a closed-ended tube. And in fact, the same mathematics tells us more about the overtone series. If you overblow a flute, if you blow harder, what you get is the next term on its overtone series. If you overblow a clarinet, you get a different thing. Remember, the, the boundary condition on the right side is that the right side has to be a maximum or a minimum. This is predicting that on a flute, when you overblow, you overblow the octave. Whereas on a flute, if you look at this, this is exactly one third of the wavelength of the original. And one third is going to be up an octave and a fifth, if you think through the music of that. So this is what the mathematics is predicting. We can test this. So uh, here's Aaron playing the flute. And here's my friend Paul Sagan uh, playing it on a clarinet. And again, the, we predict that it's going to jump to a higher note, an octave and a fifth. There we go. The math mathematics is right again. Yay! All right. Um, I want to demonstrate a, a little bit about how these overtones uh, play out on a string instrument. Um, and so what I want to do is, is, is I'll play these. Um, I'll play what are called string harmonics. So the idea here is we know that the string is never going to move at the, either of the endpoints. But what if we also require that it doesn't move in the middle? And I want to be really clear. I don't mean that I'm going to stop the string everything up to that point. I mean I'm just going to lightly touch it. It's as if we, uh, Mahal and I were up here rotating this, and somebody just sort of touched the string right in the middle without grabbing it, just touched it lightly. We can think through what's going to happen, because the string is trying to vibrate in all of these ways simultaneously. But stopping the string in the middle is going to stop this fundamental from vibrating. If you touch that in the middle, it would completely disrupt that. But not the second wave waveform. The second, the first harmonic, right, has, that, has that point in the middle where it wasn't moving anyway. Touching it in the middle won't matter. And if you think through that, what you're going to get is you're going to get all the even terms are going to be allowed to vibrate, and the odd ones are going to be dampened out. So we should hear only the even terms. And if I do this, there's the middle. Those are just the even terms. And if I went over and recorded this, what we would see is you don't have all of those spikes. Now you just have the even ones. We've just removed all of the odd spikes from the, from the spectrum. So we could do that with other fractions, not just 1 half. If we stopped the string 1 third of the way, you can think through. It's, no, it's the third one, and then the sixth one, and then the ninth one that have nodes 1 third of the way up the string. And so you would be allowed to hear those, and all of the others would be damped out. You would hear only the multiples of 3, and that's what we hear. That's what that sounds like. If somebody touches the string 1 third of the way up, that's what, which vibrations are allowed to come through. Now, there's this cool like, symmetry here. If you look at that string, touching it at 1 third and 2 thirds should be the same. 
right? You can just sort of flip the string around. It should be the same. Um, so the math predicts that it's the same sound. The math is saying that there's another point way up here Those are exactly the same sound, aren't they? If you closed your eyes, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those. Um, and so the math pred is predicting that they have the same sound. And this is how violinists use fractions to show off. So if you're asked to play this note, you could either play this, or you could play this. Which one looked more impressive? Yeah. Right, so I'm, I'm going to play you a little bit from the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, and I'll play, I'll play you the easy way. I'll play it down here. So that's the easy way, and maybe we should just go on from there. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll, so I'll give it a shot. So now instead of playing that, I'm going to play it up here, right, two-thirds instead of one-third. Okay. If you, if you go and hear the Detroit Symphony, this is how any violinist will play it. They'll play this one, just because it looks better. Like that. Thanks. So that's the end of the, of the first movement of this talk. And, and I want to remind you what the main theme of this, of this movement was. Right? It's that you have these overtones, and any instrument plays all of these overtones in very predictable ways. And the mathematics tells us stuff about, about exactly what those overtones are. Um, and this, the, this idea that mathematics is abstract, that the same mathematics gets used in different places, that gives us its power, but that also makes it why it's hard to teach. And so I'll play you a little unaccompanied Bach. This is, the, this is a Bach's Alamann from Partita number two. Um, and I just want to think, I want you to think about while I'm playing this, that what I'm really doing is playing with these equations that we've seen. So here's a little bit of Bach. Thanks. That takes us to the second movement, which is Bridges, Wine Glasses, and the Bay of Fundy, which is a very strange title. The thing that all three of these have in common is, is, is the idea of resonance. And that's the second movement of this talk. You know, if we're talking about winds, we're really just done. They're just vibrating columns of air. But if we're talking about strings, you know it has to be more than just the vibrating strings. You know the wooden box has to be important. I mean, one piece of evidence for this is that if it were just the strings, people wouldn't be paying millions of dollars for 300-year-old Italian wooden boxes, right? Um, so how important is this box? Um, well, it's incredibly important. And, and like one of the reasons we know this is like if it were just the string, it wouldn't matter what else I put on my violin. But if I put a mute on this bridge, you can hear it's a very different sound. In fact, uh, especially for college students, one of these things that's handy if you're a college uh, string player is this uh, something called a practice mute, just a heavy piece of metal that fits on here. And when you fit that on, and then you can practice in your dorm room without annoying everybody around you, right? And so clearly the wooden box is really important in, in all of this. Now, if we do the actual mathematics of a, of a vibrating string of, of, the, of you know, this vibrating box, it's incredibly complicated. We're not going to do something like that. But I do want to show you uh, a little applet from, from, uh, from Mathematica, which gives you some idea of what's going on and why this resonance turns out to be important. So we're going to pull up something from Mathematica. Again, it's not, these are not an actual uh, equations that demonstrate a violin, but they really give you some of the key ideas. So let's go over to Mathematica. 
Now initially this model just has, it's just a simple harmonic oscillator if you know that term. And it's just sort of a, you know, a spring going up and down. Or you can think of it as a pendulum as well. But if a string goes up and down, that's a, sort of a good, uh, a good model for this. Except that you notice that that sound dies out, right? It doesn't stay the same volume the whole time. And so we can, we can model that by adding in a little bit of friction. And so we dampen this model a little bit. So here's the damping bar. And so if we dampen this a little bit, you now see that indeed that does die out in this model. So now we get if we have a model that does die out, just which is nicely like that. But now you'll notice that most of the time when I play my violin, I don't just like pluck it and let it ring. I'm actually continually adding energy into the system with my bow. And so we can add energy to the system. And we can, there's two variables we have when we add energy. We can say how hard we're pushing, but we can also say how frequently we're pushing. We can push really slowly, or we can push really frequently. And so there's two variables there. And so we want to add some driving force. Let's add some driving force to that here. And now we can change the driving frequency. And what you'll notice is that, oh my gosh, did you see that right there? There's some frequency. And if we drive the system with that frequency, it sounds really, it looks really nice. It'll just keep vibrating like that. And if we're away from that one frequency, watch what happens. If we get away from that frequency, you notice that the vibration is not nearly so pronounced anymore, right? What that's telling us is the system has some frequency that it really wants to vibrate at. It has what we call a resonant frequency. Let's put this back at this resonant frequency for a second. There we go. And let's go back. You see, this becomes really important if you're picking an instrument. If you're picking an instrument, you don't want an instrument that does that. Right? You don't want an instrument where you play it, and most of the time it doesn't sound very but you don't want just one note to resonate. You want them all to resonate. So when you're picking an instrument, you do these crazy things. Right, you play all over the instrument to make sure it doesn't have just one resonant frequency, to make sure it resonates at all of these different frequencies. There's also a way of demonstrating sort of these resonant frequencies called throat singing. Does, that, does anybody know how to throat sing in here? I can do this, but I do it pretty poorly. So I, I, you know, if there's anybody who's good at this, I would rather have them demonstrate. What throat singers do is there's some resonant frequency, and your vocal tract has some resonant frequency. And what that means is if you sing one note, you can put your vocal tract in a position to resonate one of the higher overtones. And then you can hear that. And this is what it sounds like. I'm going to keep singing the same note, but I'm just going to change the internal structures of my throat, and you'll hear the different overtones. And really good throat singers can pick out very particular overtones just by changing the shape of their, of their vocal tract. And what they're doing is they're just giving it different resonant frequencies by changing that. Now, resonance can sometimes go badly awry, and the mathematics does predict this. So if we go back over here to Mathematica, and if we drive the system, and if we take this driving amplitude, if we drive it too hard, watch what happens to this. You can see that if we drive it too hard, this vibration goes really badly awry. It vibrates way too much. And you can imagine that it would break a system. And we can see that, um, you can see that sometimes in bridges. So, if you walk across a bridge, if you have some vibrational frequency, it can really harm things. When the, the Millennium Bridge in London was first opened, it turns out it had a vibrational frequency back and forth, left to right, that was about the same frequency as a walking pace. And what that meant, when you walk, you have a slight side-to-side -side, uh, action. And if the bridge starts to move, you feel a little unstable. And one thing you do is you put your feet further apart, and that just accentuates the whole thing. There's a feedback loop there. <laughs> When they first opened this bridge, people were getting ill, and some people were falling down because the bridge was vibrating and had a resonance frequency right there. To fix this, they had to delay the opening of the bridge for two years. The Millennium Bridge was really opened in 2002 because of exactly this. They had to put dampeners to dampen the vibration in that one particular direction. 
There are cases in history of bridges coming down because they are vibrated at their resonant frequency. You know, famously, Russia, or, uh, uh, Roman soldiers were told to break stride when they went over a bridge to avoid problems like this. There's a common misconception about a bridge out west. I'm, I'm guessing many of you have seen a video of the Galloping Gertie, right? So this Tacoma Narrows bridge that, that went down. This was probably not a wind speed resonance phenomenon. This is probably something more akin to um, aeroelastic flutter. If you take a piece of paper and blow on the edge, you can get it to do that. That's probably more what was happening with this particular bridge. You can also see resonance gone awry in some other places. Anybody seen this, uh, this Mythbusters episode? Mm -hmm. So they got this singer to break a glass just by singing. And one of the things you'll notice that the singer did is he tapped the, 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 the wine glass. He was listening for the resonant frequency and then singing at exactly that resonant frequency. And if you sing loud enough, then it will um, shatter the glass entirely. The Bay of Fundy is an interesting example of a resonant frequency. If you go up to northeast Canada, the Bay of Fundy has tides that are 55 feet from top to bottom. Right, 55 foot tides. The reason is that the thing driving the tides, which is the moon, the gravitational pull of the moon, is exactly the right frequency to push water at the right time. You know, if you, if you, thought about, if you think about sitting in a bathtub and pushing water toward the other end of the bathtub, that wave would go to the other end and it would come back, and there would be an exact right time to push again so that you built up a bigger wave. That's exactly the frequency that's important, and that's exactly the frequency of the rotation of the Earth gets the moon to make that at exactly the right frequency. The Bay of Fundy is closed at the other end, right? It's a clarinet, it's not a flute. If the Bay of Fundy were the Straits of Fundy, it would have a different resonant frequency because the mathematics would be different. Or, you know, if the, if, if the Earth rotated slightly slower, it wouldn't be the Bay of Fundy that had the resonant frequency that gave it the huge tides. It would be some other bay somewhere else in the world that it would then have, have resonant tides. You can, uh, you can demonstrate vibrations gone awry on a violin. Violinists don't like to do this. It doesn't <laughs> sound very good. But um, there's a way of vibrating a, a violin where it doesn't sound very good, and it's usually up here, way up here. If I play a note near it, right, that sounds okay, but if I hit that C, I'm not doing that, right? It's the vibrations of the violin itself. Like, it's, it's hitting a resonant frequency, and that's the problem on those. Now again, the question, well, like, why should you care? And this is an absolutely amazing fact. The reason you should care about resonance is that that's how we hear. The reason we can hear different pitches and tell you know, a woman's voice from a guy's voice and all these different instruments is because inside of our ear, way inside of the cochlea, there's something called the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane has, has different resonant frequencies at different parts. And when a sound comes into our ear, the, sound, the ear actually breaks it down into different parts because different parts of the basilar membrane vibrate because of different components of the sound. What's going on is that your ear is doing this. It's breaking down a wave into its component frequencies. Your ear is doing a Fourier transform. It's doing the spectrum that we did on a computer over there. This is a phenomenal fact that, like, that evolution has gotten us to the point where we're doing this, what is now advanced mathematics, and your ear does it naturally. That's absolutely phenomenal. So here are the main ideas of the second, uh, the second movement, that resonance is an important phenomenon in music. Um, and that resonance is something we can understand musically. And finally, that resonance, the reason this is important is because resonance is something that helps us hear. And so I want you to think about all of those while I play, uh, again, a little bit of unaccompanied Bach. So I'm going to play um, uh, a little bit from Partita number 3. This is the Gavotte and Rondo. What I want you to think about while I'm playing this is all of the different resonances that are going on. There are resonances in my violin that are sort of allowing it to, to amplify, to get to your ears, but then there's, there's another resonant phenomenon going on inside of your ears that allows you to hear this music. So here's the Gavotte and Rondo.
Thanks. That brings us to our third movement. Music is a secret exercise in arithmetic of the soul, unaware of its active counting. This is, of course, Leibniz, the co-founder, the co-discoverer of calculus. And he's saying in here that mathematics is hidden inside of music. And like even the music itself is sort of unaware of the mathematics hidden inside of it. This sounds like just a perfect little piece of music, right? You will not believe the mathematics that's hidden inside of this piece of music. And that's what we're going to uncover in this third movement. Do you hear the math in here? We're going to talk about transformations. Now a transformation transforms something. It keeps some aspects of it the same while transforming and changing other aspects. You can think of transformations in both mathematics and in music. If you had mathematical transformations, you could think of a reflection. It's keeping some aspects of, of that figure the same, but it's changing others, right? You could reflect over an x-axis or a y-axis. Um, you could also translate. You could just move something, say, up one unit. Or, of course, if you did that twice, you could move it up two units. Those are all sort of basic geometrical transformations. And the study of transformations, the mathematical study, is group theory. Who's had a group theory class? Yeah, so you've seen group theory, probably not in a musical setting. This is a very different introduction to group theory. Here are some groups of numbers that you would study in a group theory class. Um, you might study the integers. So all the integers are going down, down to negative infinity and positive infinity. Obviously, I've only put like a part of this table up here. Um, but you know, if you add 2 to 3, you get 5, right? So it's a basic addition chart that we know well. And that's a group under addition. You can also see some other groups, including uh, the group Z2, which is the integers mod 2. You can think of just the even numbers and the odd numbers, but instead of thinking of them as individual numbers, think of the whole group of even numbers and odd numbers. If you add evens to evens, you get these set evens. If you add evens to odds, you get the set odds. And in fact, if you add odd numbers to odd numbers, you get all of the evens back. And so it has this lovely chart, which is indeed a group. Now you could have groups of transformations instead. You could think about going up one unit or up two units. And if you think about that, the chart for that looks exactly like the one for integers. You know, here's, if you go up one unit and then up two units, the net result is that you've gone up three units, right? Um, and so really this chart has the same structure as z. It's the same structure as the integers. And if you did reflections, you could reflect over the axis. But if you reflect it again, you're back to where you started. And so the, ref the chart for reflections gives you back to where you started, gives you no reflection if you do the reflection over the x-axis twice. And this has the same structure as the evens and the odds that we called z2. And so these are all just basic, uh, basic examples of groups. Now if you did multiple reflections, if you reflected over the x-axis and then the y-axis, that's something new, and so we would need a new name. Um, I've called it up here Rx, Ry, reflect over the x and then the y. Um, and so you would get a chart like this. Uh, mathematicians in the room know this as a Klein 4 group, z2 cross z2. Here are the, the pioneering mathematicians uh, who did work in group theory, uh, including Emmy Noether, in, uh, who was born in 1882. I want you to pay attention here to the birth dates of these people. What I claim in this last bit is that composers were using similar ideas many years before, including Bach, who died in 1750, before any of those four folks were born. Yay, music. <laughs> like, music was ahead of the mathematics, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, here, let me explain exactly what I mean. And we're going to use this lovely little melody. I'll tell you in a minute where we get this melody from. But if we have this original melody, we could transform it. We could apply these transforms. If we f invert it, if we flip it over the x-axis, we play it like this. We've really just taken that and flipped it upside down. Uh, sort of anchoring it along the, a G, if you know your music. So that's an inversion. We could also flip it over a Y axis. We could play it back to front. Musicians call this retrograde. It sounds like this. And finally, there's one more that's missing. We could take our original melody, flip it over the X axis first, and then the Y axis. That would be what we call a retrograde inversion. Now all of those sort of see, sound you know, perfectly simple little melodies. Now this melody, it's the bass line from the Goldberg Variations. So the Goldberg Variations are this fantastic piano piece, and the left hand is playing exactly these notes. And if you put these transformations together, you get this amazing piece 
called the 14 Canons on the Goldberg Ground. I want to point out a couple things about this. First of all, it's a piece of Bach who died in 1750 that we did not find until 1974. It was stuck in a copy that we know Bach owned at some point. The other thing I want to point out is that this is just a single sheet of music and it encodes six minutes of music. And that's what we're going to try to explore. How do you encode six minutes of music in just a, a single sheet like this? So here's the very first one. On the left you see Bach's own handwriting and I've cleaned it up on the right. And what I want to point out is on the far right of that, um, there's a backwards clef. And you can see it in Bach's handwriting. It's this backwards clef. What that's indicating is that this isn't just for one instrument. This is for two instruments. One of them is supposed to play backwards. One is supposed to play retrograde. And so if you write those out, it looks like this. And we're going to hear a recording of it. It'll just be the first line first, and then the second line will join it. So that sounded sort of amazing together, right? It just sort of magically meshed with itself. Here's the second canon. Again, you see Bach's handwriting on the left. And again, there's a backwards clef on the right saying that you should play the second part backwards. If you write them out, it looks like this. And that is the inversion and the retrograde inversion of the original melody played together. Again, they just sort of match, they, it makes beautiful music. Here's the third one. And here's something ad addition in here, additional in here. There's a clue for an inversion. The only way to interpret this clef with this sharp being an F sharp is if it's upside down. So this is arguing that the second player is supposed to play this upside down. And there's one more bit. This del seno over there is indicating that one of the players is supposed to wait a little bit before starting. And so one part has to be delayed a little bit. And again, the first part first and then the second part joining it. It's just beautiful music. It just sort of like magically flows together. Uh, and again, like it's a duet, but it's written with just like a single line of music. We could go through all of these canons, and some of these are really fantastic in, in the way Bach constructed them, but I want to jump to the 14th canon. The 14th canon deals with two new transformations, uh, augmentation and diminution. Augmentation is just playing something twice as slow, and diminution is playing it twice as fast. <coughs> That's all you really need to know. Um, and when you combine these with other transformations, you get canon 14. Here's the original handwriting. It's written in four parts with augmentation and diminution. Do you see four parts? Here it is written out. I'll play, I'll play what's written for you. Here's the original part. And this is like a, a musical puzzle. What are the four parts and how do they sound together? And so different people have solved this puzzle in different ways. And I'll show you the, the most popular. One player is supposed to play the original line. The next player is supposed to augment it, play it twice as slow, and invert and transpose it, and play it like that. The third part it augments again and transposes it. And the fourth part augments again, inverts it, and transposes. And if you do that, that bottom line is the original melody that's from the Goldberg Variations. And if we put it all together, it's an amazing piece of music. Right? It sounds so elegant and wonderful, but it has this underlying mathematical structure that you would never otherwise know about. Right? He was able to write this music in a single line and then using transformations transform that into four parts. It's really a phenomenal accomplishment. The main theme of this last movement is that Bach was using mathematical structures, especially in his fugues and canons, that were really similar to group theory, which came much later. In some sense, Bach was predicting the future of math. Yay, Bach! Yeah, that's impressive. And so today we've seen three different ways in which mathematics and music are connected. Overtones, resonance, and then transformations. 
And that brings us to the end. The whole point of this is that math helps us understand music, and music helps us understand mathematics. Um, and so to close, what I want to play for you is a little bit of the Bach Chaconne. <laughs> I eventually learned how to play the Bach Chaconne. I eventually got tenure. <laughs> that's one of those. That's one of those. It, it's actually a causation correlation sort of question in there. Um, but as I play this, I, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, I'm starting up here at double A. So Bach has gone through the alphabet once already. So this is you know, a good 14 minutes into this piece. This is just the last two and a half minutes or so of the Bach Chaconne. And what I want you to do is I want you to listen for what Leibniz called the arithmetic of the soul. Listen for the mathematics that's buried inside this beautiful music. So I'm hoping we have some good questions from the audience. Yeah, back here. You were saying that when you change the different pressures inside of a, uh, a tuned instrument, that's how the, the sound changes, correct? Uh-huh. How come with uh, most tube instruments, that if you don't change the length of the, of the actual instrument, it doesn't matter how much pressure, you can only hit certain notes? Um, it's exactly the same mathematics, right? So if you don't change the length, then you can overblow, you can add energy to it. And you can think of getting the different overtones here. You can also think of it as getting the different energy levels of an electron. So you can only hit certain notes because of the mathematics, because, because essentially, you're, because of the end conditions, the boundary conditions, only certain functions will fit inside of there. And that's why you get different ones. Now, which ones depend on the, on the geometry of the instrument, and, and sometimes in, depending on the bell and things like that. So for instance, this is a, a little known fact. Uh, inside of a clarinet, it's just a, a cylinder, an empty cylinder. Inside of an oboe, it's actually a cone. And that affects the different overtones that you can get on those two instruments. Great. Yeah? yeah uh, as a non-mathematician, I don't know 
really was amazed by this presentation. It really was simplified. And what I learned from it was that the musical composers and the mathematicians are really drawn to the same structure for their, for their comparisons. So rhythm is arithmetic. But the analogy I wanted to make, to, in addition to Bach, was that you know, from the 1900s, 20th century going forward, you know, the variety of music generally gen begin to change exponentially. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have ragtime, you have blues, you have scat, you have rock and roll, and so forth. My observation is that around the early 1900s, you had musicians, Irish musicians, you had Jewish musicians, you had, then you had Arab, I mean, African American musicians. But they all have basically the same four notes. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Yeah. But then that's how they the Irish do it. Mean, the Jewish people mean <clears throat> da, 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 da. and then the African American go da, 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 da. I mean, but you still had the same four notes. Mm -hmm. And that's where the mathematics I think comes in. I, there's some fascinating things if you look at different musical traditions. Like one of these fascinating things is um, the overtones on a string. The first uh, the first overtone was the octave, and the next one was the fifth. Right? right? So if you hear almost any vibrating object, you hear the octave and the fifth. Almost e so every musical tradition on earth has the octave in it. You can play an octave. Almost every musical tradition on earth includes the fifth. There's only one big musical tradition that doesn't include the fifth, and that's Indonesian music. Does anybody know anything about Indonesian music? The, like the, the, the big instrument in Indonesian music is the gamelan which is neither a vibrating string nor a tube of air. It's vibrating uh, like pieces of wood. If you do the mathematics on a vibrating piece of wood, it does not vibrate the fifth. And so there's actually a mathematical reason why Indonesian music would not have the fifth in it, but any other music that's based on a vibrating string or a vibrating tube of air would have a fifth. So there are important reasons why so many musical traditions include some of the same exact notes. Yeah, good. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So when I was learning the cello in college, I had a crappy pre-war Czech cello with a bad sound. And then I read that Jano Starker had introduced an innovation, which was to put a little cone in the foot of the bridge, uh -huh. which kind of magically improved the sound of the cello. I had that done, and it really did. Uh -huh. Does that have any meaning to you? Um, I haven't heard about that particular thing. There are always little things that you can do. Like one of the new innovations on a cello is, you know about wolf tones, right? So you, that, this, oh, I heard you play. Yeah, right, so on a cello, they can be particularly <coughs> bad. And now they've figured out that if they put a magnet inside the, the cello and then a little piece of metal on the outside, if they just add a little bit of mass to one place on a the cello, they can eliminate the wolf tones. And so some cellists now, you'll see this little dot that's sitting there on their cello, and that's just, it's dampening that, that bad vibration that they don't want to hear. So there are always little things that you can do, including one of the adjustments you make on any string instrument is that there's a post inside of a viol any string instrument called the sound post, and small adjustments in that change the resonant properties of the wooden box. And it makes some parts sound better. It sometimes makes some sound parts sound worse. So you'll sometimes go in for an adjustment of your, of your string instrument, having they just sort of adjust the, where the, the sound post is a little bit. If you made a steel violin, uh -huh. what would it sound? If you made a steel violin. I mean, they so played them. Yeah, so if, you, so if you hear a steel violin, typically what it is, it's an electric violin, and they're using a pickup to pick up the sound. And then it doesn't really matter what it's made of. Oh, steel. I've seen these. I have never actually played any of these. We've heard them. Yeah. I've heard them. Yeah, so, you know, different, uh, different, um, different oh, materials are going to have different vibrating properties, and so it'll sound very different. These people who made them did a film in our building, uh -huh. and they left us one. Oh, wow. But, you know, I couldn't figure out what the hell difference it made whether you had the wood or the <laughs> I can assure you a violinist would think it would make a huge difference. Yeah, a question here? Um, so uh, this is more like, I guess, a question of advice. Uh, so uh, clearly, uh, you have your passion about music and math. Um, I'm a, currently an electrical engineering student, I'm a freshman, uh -huh. and I've grown an interest for like, sound engineering because music is a big part of my life as well. I played piano since I was little. Um, so I was wondering, like, what have you done to combine like, two different fields in your professional career uh, to get to where you are now? Because it's pretty cool what you're um, doing. I think this is, this is sort of where academia is going in general. One of the hottest areas in academia right now is biomathematics. 
Um, you know, just a couple, I think a year and a half ago, the statistics out there were, you know, if you get a PhD in mathematics, you get one salary. If you get a PhD in biology, you get another, sal another salary. They're about the same. If you get a PhD in biomathematics, you get about double that for a salary. Right? It's because there are the people who can combine these two different fields are fairly rare. And to do it really well is, is, is very impressive. So uh, you know, I think it can only be, it can only be a, 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 to your benefit to have interests that are sort of in different fields and to find ways of combining those to sort of to like improve the way you're, you're a better electrical engineer because you know the music. You can be a better musician because you know the electrical engineering. It can only be to your benefit. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, right here. So after uh, splitting uh, music into mathematical components, can you write a computer program to compose some music? Um, there are people who, so uh, there are people out there who, who sort of make the claim that music is just entirely mathematical. I think that's largely crap. <laughs> like there are parts of music, like when I'm up here playing, playing Bach, I'm not thinking through the, uh, the equations and all of that. You know, some parts of it are just pure aesthetic. Right? And so I think you're, you're missing some of that. There are people who have written computer programs to compose in the style of Mozart or in the style of Bach. And I think that there's something a little bit missing from all of those. Um, uh, you know, you can make it so that it sounds okay, but typically if you actually watch what people do is they write their program and then they run it like a hundred times and then they listen to them and then they pick out one. Right? And then they play it for you. Like, my computer program you know, composed this. Well, your computer also programmed a bunch of crap <laughs> that I didn't play for you, right? And I'm only, I'm only playing this one thing. So I think, there's a, uh, you know, I think that's, a, a, that's maybe a, a little too far to ask. Yeah. Maybe one more question? I have one question. Oh. Did you play the Chacon for the guy that you interviewed with? <laughs> <laughs> No, no. So I, yeah, I don't usually part, tell this part of the story. Um, so, uh, so what happened is I moved to Southern Maryland. So if, you, if you've ever looked at a map, Southern Maryland is like in the middle of nowhere. I was like a, a single 28-year-old guy in Southern Maryland. It's, yeah, it's not a, um, it wasn't a happening social scene, let's just say that. Um, and, and so sometimes, like in the first couple of weeks, uh, you know, I, I, I was teaching my two classes. I had a course release, so I was only teaching two classes. I had some time. And so I picked out the Chacon, and at night I like started hacking through it. And it's just awful at first when you play something really hard. And so it was just, it was awful. But every night I would come back and I would be able to play through a little bit more. And maybe around October I could sort of get through the first half of it. And somewhere toward the end of uh, October I realized I could get through the whole thing. And then I started thinking, like, this could be really fun. And so I reserved the concert hall for the last day of classes of the fall semester. And I didn't tell him at all. And, and uh, about a week before, I said, you know, I just want to get something on your calendar. The last day of class is at 3 o'clock. You know, I, I want to do something with you. And so uh, last day of class is 3 o'clock. I grabbed my violin and I walked with him. He had no idea what was going on. And we went over to this, to this hall that seats about 300, right? And I sat him down in the middle. And I went up on stage and I played him the Chacon. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.